Now, folks, um, I'm totally stoked. I'm totally psyched because somebody has entered the room whom I have um, uh, uh, promised that we'd get, you know, a guest appearance by our good friend, the awesome Dr. Mark Gustav, professor at University of Michigan. Yay! Woo! Mark <laughs> is, I don't know whether you know Mark. Mark, for, for those who are computer science educators, Mark is like the computer science educator. His blog on computer science education, Gustav's Take, I think is how you named it, is like the premier source of wisdom, I think, for most of us. Um, it's like almost the most official publication there is, kind of. Mark has been doing this for decades. He, for many, many years, he's taught at Georgia Tech. Mark is really the inventor of not just the pedagogy, but also most of the technology of <laughs> media computation. Um, he is really one of the world's best programming educators. He has taught me a lot of programming that I know. I learned small talk by following and reading Mark's books on Squeak that he wrote. Um, he is now at the University of Michigan. Mark, a couple of years ago, he has gotten kind of one of the most prestigious awards, the Karlstrom Award for Outstanding Contributions to Computer Science Education from ACM 60 for his work on media computation. Um, I'm totally happy to have Mark agree to, you know, kind of delight us and enlighten us on his experiences um, with SNAP and particularly with this thing that we're doing with you right now, um, that is the media computation, um, not media, that is the AI, kind of the um, gesture recogni recognizer. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Thank woo. you, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Bo. Good to see everybody. Edgar, could I have permission to share screen? Oh, wait, can I give you permission to screen? Yeah, Jens is screen? the commander of this. Hey, Jens, I'm the commander. <laughs> wait, how do I do this? Okay. Uh, meeting Jens, info? Meeting options. Please. Who can share? Who can present? People, everyone. Everyone can present. Because I've got my share button is grayed out. Can you now oh, try again? Now it just changed me. Okay. Hey, wow, look at this. Ah. <laughs> All right, let's see. How do I do So it this? does work for a few things. Okay. <laughs> Have you used Teams before? There's a share button not, at I the top right. Me. Yeah, I'm in that. I've, I've got that. Um, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to share screen window. Okay, do that. And there we go. Okay. And you can see my slides? We can. Yes, we can. Yay! All Ooh. right. Um, let's, let's see. How do I make that go now? All right. There we go. Uh, oh, and let me put this in the in the chat. Uh, I think I saved this URL. Loop. Yes. Okay. That's where I put links to everything that I'll be showing you today. Um, okay. Do that. Do that. So this is the class where I have been using uh, Grand Gestures. Uh, it's uh, Comp Four. It's we're, we have a brand new program, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Um, it's the program in computing for the arts and science sciences. And COMP4 is our course code and stands for Computing 4. So the idea is that we are not just teaching computer science, we're teaching computing for other things. And this is the course on computing's impact on justice. And I was really fortunate to uh, get connected with uh, Anatoly Fondrik at the University of Oldenburg. And Anatoly gave a couple of guest lectures and he uh, worked with Yadga and got me the grand gesture stuff. So I was able to use it in my class. So I'm gonna show you a few of the slides that I actually gave students what the homework assignment was and then how I used it later as well. Um, so I had students working on a recognizer homework. So you all just saw code like this where I told them about how they were using this code up for, except for the very last block for being able to draw gestures. And then I had them connect in the broadcast block to be able to recognize. And then I pointed out to them that it's always going to return something, the closest match, even if it's wrong, in the sense of it wasn't actually what you were trying to, to, to create. Um, so, and then I showed them the various gesture responses that were already built in. And then we talked about building other ones that they could build. The assignment, oh, and then I had everybody in class teach your recognizer one new gesture. 
And this was great to do in class because I told them to make it work for others. So everybody's handing their laptop to one another. Here, you go try to do a square. And I heard lots of, you make a square like that? Why would you make a square like that? Um, and which is great to, to get people thinking about all the different ways in which people could do things. I had them use both left and right hands. So I gave them about 10 minutes. Uh, they were all working at tables to do this. And then we had a, a big discussion about what makes the recognizer work, what didn't work. For example, we found that if you tried to recognize a square and also tried to recognize a circle, that was really hard because if you just have a large area like that, it was really hard for the recognizer to recognize a difference between them. Um, so we talked about what happens if the shapes are close together. What happens if your examples conflict? So I also talked to them about, you know, you don't have to keep all of the gestures that are already in the recognizer. You could delete all of those and start over again if you found that you were getting close matches to something else. And then we talked about changing left and right hands, drawing in one direction versus the other. Um, and then I gave them a set of blocks as an examples for how they could manipulate the training set. So I, before I gave them the Grand Gestures project, I saved all the original examples in a separate variable so that they could always get back to the original examples if they wanted to, but they could also delete all the examples if they wanted to retrain it. Um, and so that, would, that gave them some flexibility in what was actually in their training set. So this was the actual homework then that I gave the students, that they had to, re had to train the recognizer to recognize three gestures, but I was going to be the, the tester. So they had to think about what, and, I, and some of the students said, could you try this so I just know whether or not it'll work for you? Was And, and sometimes I did. And what the funny is how often it didn't work, right? They didn't have enough gestures trained yet so that it could understand me. And they're doing it like, okay, you shouldn't make it like that. Make it like this, you know, and they're trying to coach me along. So a big part of it was that they had to give me text that I could understand, instructions, so that I would make the gesture the way that they wanted, that I understood what their gesture was. So here's an example of an assignment built around the, the Grand Gestures project that you just saw. I'll pause there for a minute before I go on. Are there any questions for me and how I use this in the class? No, but I love this. Yeah, we that's really that. neat. <laughs> we should awesome. add that, totally add that. Yeah, to the that's thing. a wonderful <laughs> idea, Mark. <laughs> what's, so the then, practical, what's the practical application of these in real life? What is the practical application in real life? Yes. Um, it wasn't meant to be that I expect them to be able to train gestures like they would make on an iPad or uh, a touch screen. It was more about they recognized that recognizing a gesture was a recognition system. And we talked a lot in class. Anatoly did a particularly great job of it. There's a whole set of slides that the, the, the group in, in Germany has been setting up um, to talk about you know, how gesture recognition is in, there's a, a metaphor to be made about how facial recognition works or even how speech recognition works. So the gesture recognition was one way of making it very accessible to students. What does it mean to create a training set? What does it mean to, re to recognize a gesture and then to respond to that gesture? Does that help? Yeah, it does. W what's behind my thinking is I, uh, I, I'm a business professor and I'm thinking of uh, how I can use this mm -hmm. uh, to create gestures uh, in the business context so I that uh, maybe to um, affirm a customer, encourage a customer to continue to dive through um, uh, options that are presented to them. And so pretty much like an emoji-like mm -hmm. gesture mm -hmm a response to customer inquiry, customer interest. But maybe maybe I'm thinking too much outside of the box. Um, no, I think that's that's really great. But I would probably talk about those things as implications of what the students are doing. Um, so I can I can speak a little bit about, so who's taking this class, Guzdal? This is kind of a weird class, Computing's Impact on Justice from Text to the Web. Um, it's a new course in our liberal arts and sciences college. So I actually did have business students. I actually had a few CS students, but I had a lot of students from all over the university, uh, psychology students, communication students, uh, music students. Um, 
And so these were students, and it's an open question for us. So why did they take this class anyway? And it's actually an area of research. I have a student who's been doing interviews with these students to understand. So why, what, what are these folks after? Um, for most of them, they didn't want to take a traditional computer science class. They don't want to become software developers, but they wanted, for example, to develop what's called conversational programming ability. They wanted to be able to have a talk with a programmer, know what their tasks are, understand what their language is, so after doing the gesture recognizer, my students could talk about a training set. They could talk about the task of recognition and how recognition is a heuristic process. It isn't one to one. It's going to be complicated to make a match between a particular gesture and the training set. And that's the kind of conversations I wanted to be able to have with these students. OK, thank you. Sure. So that was the part where uh, I, uh, Anatoly gave a, a lecture on AI, a lecture on machine learning, and then I did this one, which was introducing the homework, which was more hands-on. A couple of weeks later, um, I wanted to talk about the topic of generative AI. And I was able to use the gesture rock recognizer because they'd had that experience. They'd trained the recognizer. They had done this homework. So I asked them, who generates generative AI? And I talked about their gesture recognizer and the fact that they could have all of these um, various gestures that they had trained, that they had associated with some sort of a, of a key phrase. And I talked about being able to render these and now trying to generate new sketches from this. And the idea was that we could say to them, um, what if you averaged all the propellers? What you get is a now a new propeller, and but it hadn't been drawn by anybody. You'd averaged across the things that somebody actually had drawn. And then I extended the metaphor. What if you averaged a heart with the propeller? And now you're defining a completely new shape that nobody had drawn, but it was based on gestures that somebody had drawn. And you're trying to mix and match based on the gestures that are there. So then I gave them this small piece of code that given a name would average all the sketches with that name and then allow me to render it. So this, for example, is an average rendered star. Nobody actually drew the star like that in my training set, but it's based on what other people had done. That's sort of the idea of generative AI. The generative AI is going to take a bunch of data that it's gathered, in our case, the training set data, and then build something new from that. But instead of recognition, it's now doing generation. OK, I'm going to pause there. So this isn't a lot, but it allows me to build on what the experience of the students have had already to link to these idea of generative AI. And so then we can talk about, like, how does chat GPT work? Well, it just gathered up all the text that it can find on the internet and now can generate new text for you. But it can't talk about something completely novel because it's only based on what's gathered up that's out on the internet. I'll pause there. Questions? All right. So Jens had asked me to talk a little bit about, so what is this new program and, and, and what are we doing and how, is, how are we using SNAP in, this, in these courses? Um, so in tw September 2020, my colleague Gus Everard and I, he's a physicist. He actually has one of the coolest job titles in the world. He is a computational cosmologist. He actually simulates the Big Bang. It's very neat. Um, anyway, we were asked to figure out what does the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, the liberal arts and sciences folks, what is it that they need in computing? What kind of computing education? And, and separate from whatever computer science or our school of information was offering. And what we came up with is this idea that in the liberal arts and sciences, computing is organized around three themes. One is computing for discovery, all this idea of computational science, making new things. One of the things that I learned in, just, in talking with all these folks is that computational science is not the same thing as data science. Data science tends to take a great big, big task what's there. Computational scientists start out with a theory and then develop a model and then use that for whatever they're going to do with computation. Um, these are humanities people in liberal arts and sciences. For them, computing is a new form of expression. Uh, so where humanities people study a lot, text and, and now today film, now it's all about computation and how do we engage with others and how do we communicate with this new media. And the third one is this notion of critical computing or computing for justice. How do our systems have biases and exacerbate inequities? And that's where my computing for justice class is coming from. So our, our program was just launched this summer um, as of July 1st. It's Gus and me. 
um, we're the whole faculty. We are the entire department. So I, I have the best department chair job in the world. I am the department chair of absolutely nobody but myself. It's great. Um, so uh, our goals are to eventually to meet the needs of all LSA students around computing education, to create new courses, to create new programs and credentials. So we currently have these two courses, the Computing's Impact on Justice and Computing for Creative Expression. Uh, literally, we have just submitted uh, two weeks ago our proposal for a new course, Introduction to Python for the Sciences, um, and another course on the transistor disruption, how computing impacts science and society. It's going to be really cool. They're planning to use Danny Hillis's book, The Pattern on the Stone. Um, so very neat stuff. So let me say a little bit about how I'm using SNAP. SNAP is core to this class, but there's stuff on either side of it, too. So we start out teaching with these things that we're calling teaspoon languages, which are teeny, teeny, tiny programming languages. They really are programming, but they're incredibly small. So for example, here's one of them. Um, this is for pixel equations. This is related to the media computation stuff that Yagda and Jens have been doing. So the idea is that you can select pixels by putting in some sort of a Boolean expression and then define how you want the color to change. So here, everywhere where X is greater than 200, we're setting the red to 255, so it becomes very red. And we can do formulas in here, so we could say 255 minus rojo, minus the current value of red, minus the green, and now we're gonna sort of invert everywhere where X is greater than 200. So I have students starting out the idea of how do you manipulate pictures and thinking about, well, pictures actually have pixels and they have a red, green, and blue component, and I can manipulate the red, green, and blue component. Can I can use equations for that? We're doing all of that in this really simple teaspoon environment. Um, we also have some other teaspoon languages that we've been building where students can do sentence recognition and sentence generation based on parts of speech. While this is incredibly simple, you mean you might even argue this, is this really programming goes now? It's enough that you can get to debugging situations. If you type N-O-N instead of noun, it's not gonna match to anything. Um, or if you thought, well, wait a minute, lazy dog runs to the house quickly, it should recognize that house is a noun. Well, not if it's not in the dictionary. So that's related to this idea that an algorithm is intricately connected to its data in order to be able to execute. After we introduce the idea with teaspoon, and we only use the teaspoon languages like for a single lecture period, you know, so like 30, 45, maybe 60 minutes, we then start doing the same sorts of things, but in SNAP. So on the left, you can see one of the examples. We give them a whole bunch of custom blocks. We've built lots of custom blocks so that students, if you look at the thing on the left, that looks a lot like how what they were manipulating the teaspoon languages. The, the basic notion about how you're manipulating the pixels is the same. The one in the middle is based on um, a set of blocks to give them that's like the sentence recognizer. But now we're going to pick out words at random to generate phrases. So the idea here is that how does a Twitter bot respond to you? So this is looking for, it's gonna say something negative about the yellow party. This is, there's a green and yellow political party in this world. Um, it's gonna wait for a tweet back that has a green noun in it. And then it's gonna say something positive about the green noun. And the right-hand side is actually where I take the Titanic example that Yadga and Jens have done in the past, but I'm building a set of blocks to make it look a little bit like SQL. Because then at the end of the course, I'm sorry, at the end of each unit, I give them a ebook activity where I say, here's snap code that you've used before. Here's now Python code that does the exact same thing. And we do this with things like HTML. We do things like the media computation. Um, so that we get students making connections. Okay, I did this in Snap. I see how it's done in Python. I can answer questions about the Python. I'm not asking students to learn Python. All of their programming assignments are in Snap, but they're, they're getting the, the opportunity to, to connect their Snap knowledge, to transfer it into textual languages as well. So I care about conversational programming. I care about self-efficacy. I want students to come out of this saying, oh yeah, I get what this is about. I want people, I want to be positive about this. And then I want them to learn a set of concepts, but not necessarily traditional computer science concepts. I don't really care how much they know about, um, oh, I'll actually go there. I don't care about them knowing about lists all that much, but I care a lot about them knowing about there's training sets and there's recognizers and there's biases that get built into software. So let me give you a couple of examples, and I'm hoping that this is gonna work. 
Uh, so these are movies that we've made from some of the assignments that students did last semester. So the very first assignment, in fact, my students are working on it right now, is they have to make me an image collage. And this is in my Computing for Creative Expression course, where we actually look at artists' work. We look at how artists have made art with simple basic shapes, and then I ask them to, to, to build something as well. This one, I'm hoping, okay. I'm hoping this works because this is an audio one. When we get to the audio stuff, I tell, I ask the students, the homework assignment is, can you hear it? I asked them to paint me an oral scene to make it look like some world. Um, and so here there were, this student was trying to make it sound like a subway. And if you notice what they're doing here, it's really cool. They use a train sound at the top of it, the sound coming in, they're increasing the volume as the train is coming in. And then as it's leaving, they're decreasing the volume, multiplying by 0.3 and then by 0.1 and playing it backwards. It's a negative rate. And by playing it backwards, you get the sound as the train is going away. Um, this is another one. This is one, uh, it's meant to be a haunted house. Um, and there we go. I think that I'll probably stop there because at this point I was just generally going to show the Titanic example, which Yagda and Jens can do way better than me. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, that link, I'd link up to the Teaspoon languages, to the eBooks, to a lot of the SNAP projects we're building. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now in the class is I'm having them build chat bots in SNAP. And then using the cool reflection features in SNAP 8.0, I created a tool that would convert from SNAP into this web-based Charlabot language. And then the students are pro then programming the same chat bot and it allows me to talk about Here's the chat bot and snap. Here's the Charlabot. They're doing the same thing. That's an algorithm with two different program representations of the same algorithm. And we can even talk about things like how compilers work, that that's essentially what I'm doing, that I'm translating from one form into another form that I can then use in a new purpose. So stop there. Happy to take questions. Are you going to do a Snapchat uh, rendition of Wolverine mascot? <laughs> no, I've never thought of that. Though I wanted to ask, Jens, the project that you put together to, to advertise uh, where you drew my face and my facial, I'd love a copy of that, please. That was so uh, cool. I've I shown it at the beginning of this. I, I sent you the, the, the program. It's it's called Sketch a Gus Dial. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Just a thought. <laughs> Did you get feedback from the students? I, I hope they liked it, but. The feedback was really quite stunningly great. Um, I still haven't, as, as I mentioned, I have a, a PhD student, Tamara Nelson Fromm, who interviewed five of the students at two different points in the class at, at about week five and about week 12. Um, I've just started looking through the transcripts. Um, it, the, the research question that she's interested in is, so why do students take a course like this from the liberal arts and sciences and what are the challenges they face i find that question to be really interesting as another way of thinking about what is computational thinking right when we think about computational thinking we talk about abstraction and decomposition and things like that but if you think about the most fundamental stuff are stuff that like a musician faces the first time they sit down to a programming language but they don't ever want to become a software developer um, one of the stories that she told me was that I actually have a bunch of, of artists in my class, students who want to be professional artists, who are taking this because they realize computing is a new medium for them, like oil painting or like pastels or like watercolors or, or like sculpture and clay. Um, and they want to become proficient in this new medium. So these are not people who ever want to learn about, you know, GitHub or how to do abstract data types they just want to be able to express themselves with this new medium. Um, and so this is the sort of thing that we're finding out. The, the student evaluations were terrific. I suppose a better indicator of how successful the class is, 
is that we have more than doubled the number of students in the two classes. And the creative expression class, I had nine students last semester. I have 35 this semester. It has more than tripled in size. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think that's a very positive sign that it's going well. So we're talking about humanities, Mark. Um, here in this um, session right now, I think we like I really don't know much about you participants, but I think a lot of you are from business, uh, so which is arguably also a humanity, right? Um, and I think yeah. it might be one where we think that business people know about computing because who would be in business and say like computing isn't my thing, but it might be interesting to um, to liken it to humanities, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, certainly the, the, the issues of ethics play a big role. Um, at the end of the class, I was able to get into topics that particularly the business students were really interested in, like um, uh, cryptocurrencies and NFTs, because uh, the, the very end of the course, uh, we, we, we entitled it Limitations of Technology. I mean, how does cybersecurity really work? How do you get the S in HTTPS? It works because we don't know how to factor large multi-digit numbers, right? And if we did know how to factor it, the whole security would break down. And that's why quantum computing might break everything. And then the NFTs were particularly interesting to talk about because we did have artists in the room. And for artists, NFTs are a good thing because it allows them to sell their digital art. But on the other hand, it's like, but does it actually have any value later? Um, how, how does that? So we were able to have those conversations. Um, so that was all really great. Yeah, so yes, Liz, so NFTs is something that my artists, uh, artist students are definitely thinking a lot about. And so that was valuable. So I'm interested in the like in maybe somebody of the participants. Um, uh, are you doing computing with your students in in class? Like, what are the kind of things you're interested in when it's about computing? Is it more like learning a particular learning to use a particular application, or uh, are you more like um, into teaching certain parts of maybe data science, uh, R or Python. Uh, any of these questions come up with you? <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, this is uh, Colin from uh, San Jose State. So I teach uh, in the uh, AIS department, uh, but anyway, my PhD is in uh, management of information systems. Uh, so I teach a bunch of data courses uh, where I teach both a little bit of SQL, uh, I taught a little bit of R, uh, but mostly primarily we teach students how to use different tools like data science tools, uh, all these kind of things. And yeah, I, I plug in, uh, especially at the master's level, I plug in some of these um, no code, low code kind of uh, systems because they're pretty easy to use and they like it. Uh, I don't really have engineering students and I don't really have computer science science students, but most of the students in business, they kind of like to be able to do these things, uh, something like Snap or something like, uh, I know, Alteryx or something, things like that they really, really enjoy. So I guess both uh, using the tool and really understanding some ways to uh, customize the tool, but not going into too much depth related to uh, the computer sciences and even some of the theory behind it. I'm not sure that they actually know it, uh, but most of the times they seem, they seem to be able to kind of grasp all the concepts. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share just share my screen a little bit to show you that what I've been able to find is the custom blocks in Snap make it really easy for me to essentially create a no code, low code kind of tool, but within Snap. What you see here is this is some of the the, the database things that I'm doing. Um, so uh, I can show the items from billionaires where column A equals Bill Gates. And this is essentially a, uh, it looks a lot like an SQL query. Um, and so I can rec recognize 
I can reference the sorts of things that they've done before. This is an example that uh, I totally stole from, from Yad Gan Yens, um, where we've got this uh, the collection of passengers from the Titanic, and we're going to show the, um, the items from the Titanic where the, uh, the, the gender is male, and then grab just the, um, the just, we're gonna split the names into three columns, and then group by the first names, and then sort, and now you get the most common first name on the Titanic is William, the second was John, the third was George. And actually being able to do this is really hard in SQL because we're taking a field and splitting it into three fields. Um, and so this was really neat. The other one I want to show you was the way that we've been doing web pages. Um, so we actually have built a set of blocks. Let me get this out of the way because that one's covering up. Uh, do I have, I have to have JavaScript extensions turned on to do this. Um, boop, move that way. Or, anyway, it's not working. So this one here is um, we are making a web page, making a paragraph, making paragraphs. And so when I click on this, it shows me the HTML and then it really does open up and the snap page is embedded inside of it. My students, even my computer science students really love this. And you can see actually down here, um, we also created an extension to it so that we could do style sheets as well. So here's the exact same page, but with CSS applied to it. So we get a slightly different effect. We get some blue background and we get um, the, the centering of it. These blocks are doing HTML, but nobody ever have to tell you any backslashes or angle brackets. And so the students can play with the ideas of HTML right away. We do this, you know, they're, they're building web pages within 15 minutes in the class when I start talking about this stuff. And, but I'm not hiding the HTML. It's still showing up over here in the stage, but they just don't have to type it. So I'm able to get much deeper into HTML ideas and CSS ideas and how should you structure your page? Because now, you know, uh, you wanna see this page without style? Well, I'll just pull the style sheet back out and I can re-render the page, but without a style sheet. Um, and being able to play that easily with how styles work and how the structuring works. Um, so I, uh, you, you can tell I'm a big fan right now of, of, of Snap because I'm able to create a lot of no-code, low-code types of experiences by simply building a bunch of custom blocks. Well, that is really beautiful, Mark. I, I wasn't even aware of that. That's amazing. The real trick was building the block that would render the HTML. Exactly. Yeah, uh, because how are you even going to get there? Oh, you're going to have to teach me this. Um, uh, yeah. How can you <laughs> this escape? is actually awesome because we do have an HTML class for colleagues, kids, and yeah. they type a lot, and it's not very fun for them. So maybe we might want to check this out. Great. Do you need a server for that? that? I am using a server. I have See? built a very, very small server script that accepts the using URI encoding. I accept the HTML in the URL and I simply put it and serve it back again. Because that's kind of the only thing I could think of how you could manage to pull this off. Um, <laughs> cool. This is awesome. Love it. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a trick. So that was a very long answer to the question about how how do you do this with like low code and no code. So I apologize for that, but because um, I, I think about the similar things. My students are not really keen on doing software development. They certainly don't. They're not really keen even on learning things like Python. Um, so, but I'm able to touch on a lot of different concepts pretty quickly by giving them custom blocks that scaffold their way into these concepts. Any more questions? Remarks? Could you could you have pulled this up? Pull this off if you don't have full control over your server. The web page stuff right now, the only technical way that I could figure out how to do it that I could generate an I could open up a new tab given a JavaScript string was to use a server. Um, but you know, you could actually use that block. It's it's sitting on my server, but it's it's, it's not close to anybody. Anybody could use that block right now. Um, so feel free to play with it. I think I, I, I did include this project in there. Um, 
there are other ways of doing it. Uh, uh, Jens and Yagda know uh, our, our colleague Ben Shapiro at Apple, and I've been talking with Ben, and there is this thing called data encoding that you can do in a URL. Yeah, I've used it a lot in Snap, but they sort of, uh, I used to do this all the time, but they disabled it, I think, oh, or they, they don't okay. like it anymore. Like it's, it's uh, we have to look into this, but I think you don't need to have a server. I think we can pull it off without one. Let me, let me, I need to think about this, but it's cool. You know about this stuff way better than me. This was, this was a pretty serious hack for me to be able to figure out how to make that but work. It, but, you know, never mind how it's done. The result is really great because you can teach HTML, you can teach kind of how this stuff works, uh, right. you know, tagging things, uh, having, yeah, nested uh, elements and, and stacked elements. Uh, uh, which is very much the same metaphor, right? And you can teach it. Really excited about it. And actually, um, at the end, when I did do, when I introduced both the HTML and CSS, a lot of my artists were like, this is so great. Can I make my whole website like this? And it's like, no, this is just a teeny tiny thing. But what a great motivation. Now go learn some other things. Now go beyond this. My job is to make you feel confident, to teach you the basic concepts, and then you go play. Go on. All right, so I know that I'm standing between y'all and lunch break, I think. Well, it's it's more like, you know, it's it's like um, seven at night over here where we are. So we're pretending it's lunch uh, because I think for <laughs> most of y'all it's lunch. Um, Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This has been such a privilege to have you in here. Uh, like, uh, I hope you all appreciate this. Like, you got some world-class guest appearance here from uh, our friend Mark Gustal. Uh, this is uh, awesome. Thank you so much uh, to share pleasure. your pleasure. experiences, not just with Snap, but with the very thing we're working on at this boot camp today. Uh, like, this is such a great fit. Um, this is awesome. Uh, I made a recording of this. Uh, we're going to uh, ask you whether we can share it with the community afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Take care, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark.